Um, do people remember differentiation? Okay, good. Um, so what is d by dx of log x? 1 over x, right? And you know you should be able to figure out why how to do this. I mean you basically realize that y equal to log x, so x equal to e power y, and so dx equal to e power y dy, so dy by dx equal to one over e y equal to one over x. The reason I can do this is because I have a kid who goes to high school, <laughs> not because I'm in computer science. Because part of being in computer science is to completely forget all your continuous math which <laughs> you will try to remember it. Okay. Um, the other one uh, is uh, partial differentiation. Okay. In this case, the only thing that you really need to realize is when you are differentiating with respect to theta 1, this whole thing just goes to 0 because theta 2 is the variable here. So this whole thing goes to 0, and this one is just c by theta 1 plus minus d by 1 minus theta 1. Because you know, you do the substitution, you consider this to be, let's say, x, you'll get 1 over x, but then you have to do d by dx of that, um, and so you'll get a minus. And d by d theta of that, you'll get a minus. Okay? So this will be essentially c by c by theta 1 minus d by 1 minus theta 1. Okay? Um, that's just, we'll be using this, actually. <laughs> so. So I'm just reminding you that um, for once, actually, we'll be using continuous math. Um, and uh, you know, that's what I'm reminding you. OK, let's uh, get started. Are there questions? OK, um, so the, as I said, um, So, okay. so I don't know this is working. Oh, what is the log max? Oh, maybe it's this thing. Okay, and I'll answer. Okay, so we started uh, with uh, base networks. Remember and. Um, we ending base networks mostly. Today we are ending base networks and we'll start looking at learning of base network structures and then move on to other topics. Um, at the time we started base networks, uh, we looked at this guy, Odia Pearl, uh, because we looked at his home being virtualized versus earthquake and so on. And so I needed a good um, epilogue uh, to get out of base networks and so I worked with uh, ACM and um, ACM just um, announced that Hudia Pearl has been given the Turing Award for this year. Okay, what is Turing Award? It's the highest honor in computer science. Okay, and uh, that's Alan Turing, and it's particularly interesting this year because it's the centenary of Alan Turing's birth. Okay, so so he's getting essentially his Turing Award, and what's interesting is that if you read the citation, which is on the which is on the ACM uh, site that I just picked up from. It says, focusing on conditional independence as an organizing principle for capturing structural aspects of probability distributions, Pearl showed how graph theory can be used to characterize conditional independence and, and so on. That's your base networks. That's what we are looking at, DCF last time, et cetera. Okay. Uh, among the many things that he has done, you know, uh, one uh, very big contribution essentially is uh, coming up with these graphical models for capturing probability distributions. Okay, um, so that's kind of an interesting coda to our uh, uh, base networks discussion. Um, so before I actually go on into the learning part, I have to say a couple of things. Um, that I should have mentioned, I should mention at some point of time, because if if you say that you know base networks, people will expect you to know this, so I'm just going to mention this to you. Um, one point, of course, is the inference on base networks. We talked about how to improve the inference techniques. You know, we looked at the exact inference, we looked at the approximate inference, 
and we looked at the efficiency of different kinds of approximate inference techniques. The real question, of course, is how hard is inference on base networks to begin with? Okay, and uh, it should not be surprising to you that base network inference cannot be easier than logical inference because normal logic can be seen as a special case of base networks where, in fact, all CPTs are ones and zeros. Okay, so all dependencies are deterministic. Okay, so in fact, you can write any particular logical theory as a base network. Okay, so that provides you kind of a lower bound to how easy it should be to solve base networks, I mean, do inference on base networks. Uh, not surprisingly, actually, the way you show, you know, the way you show in the complexity theory, the way you show that a problem is NP-complete, for example, is to show that another NP-complete problem can be reduced to this problem in polynomial time. And so then if this can be solved in polynomial time, so can that be. And since you don't think NP-complete problems can be solved in polynomial time, this is also just as hard as this, at least as hard as this, right? Okay, so we know that satisfiability problems, that is if I give you a bunch of clauses, you know, if I give you a logical theory, and I want to see whether or not there's a model for this logical theory, that's an NP-complete problem, we know that, right? Okay, um, and so, and so um, what's interesting is given any arbitrary satisfiability problem, remember that any logical theory can always be written in clausal form like this. Right? So, and in fact, in particular, you can write it in three set. Because any, you know, we also talked about the fact that three set is just as hard as any other satisfiability problem. And in fact, you can convert any satisfiability problem to a three set problem. Okay? Um, so, anyway, if you take this simple three set problem, for example, it shows you how you can write that as a base network. Okay? And then, um, so, Essentially, then the inference on this network would tell you whether or not the original clauses are satisfiable or not. This shows that this shows that this guy should be at least as hard to solve as this guy. In the worst case, right? Because every instance of this can be solved by using this, and so this should be at least as hard as this. Okay, so that's how you actually show that base networks are at least and be complete. In fact, they are harder than NP-complete. You know, what, what winds up happening is it's not just checking the models, it is like counting the number of models. It's more like counting the number of models, okay? And so it turns out there is another uh, complexity class called Sharpie complete, uh, which is sort of expected to be at least as hard or harder than NP-complete NP problems, okay? And so base network inference is expected to be sharply complete. What's more interesting and kind of sad uh, is if you want to approximate the inference on the base network, okay, can you provide an approximation algorithm that in the worst case will do inference in polynomial time? Turns out no. Okay, for any particular approximation, um, you know, you essentially will still do uh, NPR. I mean, it'll still be exponential. Okay, so base network inference is both in exact as well as approximate cases an NP complete problem or worse because it's actually sharply complete. But when we looked at when we looked at um, um, logical theories, we looked at the fact that in the worst case, logical theories will take you know exponential time to do inference on. But we also considered special cases of logical theories for which the inference is tractable. Right? Does anybody remember any phrases from that discussion? What kinds of logical theories uh, could you uh, handle in basically polynomial time? Not exponential, but polynomial. Does the phrase Hahn clauses ring a bell? Hahn clauses are Clauses, so here, by the way, are there any Hahn clauses here? And which of them are Hahn clauses? Two. Two and what? Two. two and three are Hahn clauses? How many people think two and three are Hahn clauses? 
This is like a review <laughs> of what we have already done. What is the definition of a Hahn class? It's a class that has at most one positive literal. At most one positive literal. Positives are bad guys from the Hahn class point of view. So are there any Hahn classes there? Actually, there are no Hahn classes there. Okay. And uh, so in fact, if all of these are Hahn classes, then this should have been solvable in polynomial time. OK, so you know, the point, of course, is that for Hahn theories, inference is tractable. We know that in logic. So are there equivalent sorts of special cases for base networks where, again, inference is tractable based on some syntactic criterion? See, Hahn class is a syntactic criterion, right? When you convert it into classes, you just count the number of positive literals. If it is at most one positive literal in each class, then you know the entire set is Hahn classes, right? I mean, so a class is Hahn class if it has at most one positive literal. If a set of classes are all Hahn, then that theory is Hahn theory, right? So what can we talk about for the base networks? It turns out that the interesting question, the interesting concept there is singly connected networks are polytrees. If your base network has singly connected network topology, that means between any two nodes, there is at most one directed path. Between any two nodes, there is at most one directed path. OK? Then, that's called essentially a singly connected tree. Um, and um, in that case, it turns out base networks inference is polynomial time. OK? And in fact, the variable elimination algorithm, one of its claims to fame is, in, the, in that case, um, if you eliminate variables in the right order, you actually do get the inference in polynomial time. OK? OK, so as Hahn classes are to satisfiability theories, uh, singly connected networks are to singly connected networks are to um, your uh, base networks. Now it turns out, although we are not talking about it at any length here, it turns out that things that you may have heard of before, uh, such as Markov chains. How many of you have heard of Markov chains? Did you think Markov chains were base networks? They are. <laughs> right. Markov chains are base networks. Here is x0, influences x1, influences x2, influences x3, where x is a random variable, and uh, its value in the 0th time, 1th time, 2th time, etc. opposite. That's a Markov chain. OK? In fact, these are called dynamic base networks. The idea is that if I sort of tell you how this, how the, you know, if this is a base network, what do I need to tell you? I need to give you a prior here, P of x0. And I need to give you P of x1 given x0. Right? And I would call this a stationary Markov chain if P of x2 given x1 is the same as P of x1 given x0. And similarly, p of x3 given x2 is the same as p of x2 given x1. So the transition probabilities, the CPTs are all the same. And normal Markov chains that you cared about were all stationary Markov chains. OK? And in fact, they are actually base networks. If you unroll them, essentially, you, know, you normally specify them this way, because if you tell me the prior on the x0 and the CPT for x1, then I can, and if you want me to, if you want a Markov chain of length 15, I'll just unroll it 15 times. OK? OK? Um, so normally, we just provide it this way. But really, if you unroll it, it is a base network. OK? And if you don't unroll it, it's called a dynamic base network. OK? The more interesting question is, when I unroll it, this network, is it singly connected? Yes. So in fact, it's not a uh, useless idea to learn about the tractable subclasses. Markov chains are actually singly connected base networks. And so in fact, inference on them is polynomial. 
that's why you know people use it a lot. You know, they have actually useful, you know, useful applications, and you also get to use it. Okay. Um, another thing that a variation of Markov chains is what is called um, hidden Markov chains, where in essence x1 causes o1, x2 causes o2, x3 causes o3. These are the variables that you get to observe actually. So this is the state. But you don't get to observe the state, you only get to observe the observation, the, the indirectly the observation variable of the state. Okay? And if you have this kind of a network, this is called a hidden Markov model. You see what I'm saying? So again, connect, you know, some of you may have heard of these things in other classes, and so now you're just connecting that entire stuff to this entire stuff. You know, base networks are Markov chains, base networks are hidden Markov models. I'm sorry, opposite way. Markov chains are base networks. Hidden Markov models are mar base networks. And they are the easy ones, actually. OK? So that's what this is saying. Examples of simply connected networks include Markov chains and hidden Markov models. OK? Um, and so in fact, those are easy in the worst case, too. OK? In this one, you can see it's also simply connected, right? Because for any between any two variables, uh, between any two variables, you have only one path. By the way, I mentioned last class, since I drew this picture, I can also say that I mentioned last class that likelihood weighting idea, a version of the likelihood weighting idea is what's called the particle filters idea. And that's essentially on things like dynamic, and basically on dynamic based networks are things like hidden Markov models, which are dynamic based networks. So oftentimes, if you wind up getting evidence only on the observations. In most cases, in the hidden Markov models, you only have evidence on the observations, because nobody ever saw the state. That's why they're called hidden Markov models. You never see these. You only see these. OK, and what happens is rejection sampling is a pretty bad idea in these kinds of scenarios. Because you, know, you first sample this. Based on this, you sample this. And if it is not what it should be, according to your evidence, you will kill it. Okay, and in those cases, uh, variations of likelihood weighting, um, especially one called particle filtering, is very useful. Okay, um, all I did here is establish some connections, you know, which you might, which might, you know, come to your aid later on. You know, I didn't give you algorithms right now. Okay, but this much you should know that base network inference is and be complete. Actually, shall be complete. And that uh, if the network is singly connected, that means there's at most one path between any two nodes, then it is uh, polynomial time. OK, so now here's my question. Remember the network that we, you know, we looked at two networks in, in this class. Let's see, um, burglary, earthquake, um, alarm, John calls, Mary calls. That was one network we looked at. The other network we looked at is uh, cloudy, uh, sprinklers, uh, rain, wet grass, right? That's the other network we looked at. These are the two we just spent a lot of time on. OK? Um, so tell me whether any of them are singly connected. What? Left one. This one is singly connected. This is a good guy. So you wasted a lot of time on actually solving a polynomial time problem. But you used it to develop a theory which works for any arbitrary base network. So that's good. We just use this as an example. OK? How about this guy? It's not. OK? What if I were to tell you that I can convert this as this C in plus it affects what's called sprinkler rain super variable, which then affects wet grass. Right? <laughs> okay. So so basically I previously I had P C and here I had uh, P S P given C, P rain given C, and P wet grass given uh, SP and rain. That's what you had previously. Right? In the new one, 
I'll have new probability tables. Okay, but actually this table is the same, PC. This one, can I compute this from these? Yeah. Okay. Basically, uh, since after all, these two are independent given this, okay, you essentially can compute uh, P, S, P plus rain given C. How big is this table? How big is this table? How big is this table? Two values. Two values. How big is this table? Two values. This, this table is two values? Why should it be two values? Sprinkler plus rain can be true, 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 false, false, true, false, false. This, so this will be four value table. I made it a super variable called sprinkler rain variable. Its values can't just be true and false because then I'll be losing the cases where sprinkler is true, rain is false, and the situation where rain is true, sprinkler is false. So when I combine this, this will now be a four-valued variable. True, 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 false, false, true, false, false. And I can compute that you know, table from these two. Right? Right? Um, and then, of course, I will, you know, and similarly, if I have this, and I have here, you know, a four-value table, and I'll still have a four-value table. Because the four values here were coming, um, here was coming from, uh, you know, SP true, rain true, what is the wet grass probability? SP true, rain false, what's the wet grass probability? SP false, rain true, what is the wet grass probability? SP false, rain false, what's the wet grass probability? Those were the four. That's exactly the four you need here too. Right? Okay, yes. So, but in uh, the output will be either true or either false. Like both both of them have to be true in case the uh, uh, like sprinkler. Okay, I got. It. No, basically these are we just combined two things into one thing. Hmm. Okay. Yes. Um, but that still could mean essentially that you know this is in, in the super variable now takes four values. It's a Cartesian product of the values of the old variables. So in case any one of them is true, the output will be true? No. What do you mean? Like no, I, I, all I can say is this has four values, and I know the probability of WG given any of those four combinations from these tables, and I write them down. OK. OK. Now my question is this. This is multiply connected. And so it is. Exponentially hard to solve. I convert it into a singly connected network. So it's only polynomially hard to solve. So I have a now just proved P equal to NPR naught. Because when you're talking about Turing awards, I need one too. So if you say yes, then you know by acclamation I get it tomorrow. Okay. Obviously not, right? Okay, what did we do? Because complexity is always in the size of the original input. If you blow up the original input into an exponentially sized input, a new input, and say you're only linear in the exponentially sized new input, that still doesn't mean that you're you know, polynomial in the old input. OK? You are, exponent, you are linear in this, but this structure is exponential in this, because this one blew up in size. Nevertheless, if you have a huge big network, and there are only a couple of places where there are multiply connected paths. And if you can somehow get them together, it will become a singly connected network. And you happen to know that people have spent a lot of time writing off-the-shelf software, which will only work on singly connected networks and works very efficiently. You would want to do this. Do you understand what I'm saying? Right? There are a lot of people, I mean, because for the Singly connected networks, it turns out there are certain kinds of algorithms that, you know, first of all, it is efficient, because in the, in the worst case, it's only polynomial. Furthermore, because singly connected networks have singly connected structure, you can write algorithms that will take that into account. So they will fail. They won't actually get you sound results on the multiply connected networks, but they'll give you sound results on the singly connected networks. 
And since you have a hammer, you convert everything into a nail. That's what I did here. You see what I'm saying? It's a useful thing to know. Okay, and the same thing is actually true um, in, in, in any scenario where uh, there's a tractable subclass and you have something which doesn't quite fall in that tractable subclass. So you just, you know, make it a little bigger so that it will fall into the exponential, the tractable subclass, and then you solve it using the specialized algorithm for that tractable subclass. This is just pure computer science. This is nothing specific about, you know, base networks per se. So that's what I'm saying. OK, so this is a singly connected network. So is this a singly connected network? This one is it. You can convert into this. In which case, the only reason you would want to do it is you have an algorithm that only works on singly connected networks. So it will now take a bigger input and work on it. OK? Uh, and it doesn't change. The conservation of complexity holds. You didn't you know, reduce the complexity. You just are able to use the hammer that was created for singly connected networks. Those are the two things I wanted you to understand uh, before we move on from base networks. Any questions? OK, fine. Then let's go to the next one. So I asked, what's the difference between probability and statistics before you left last time? And I hope I forgot. Um, so tell me who, I mean, so all of you did probability and statistics courses. Sometimes you just did probability course, sometimes you did statistics course, but in the beginning at least you did probability statistics. What's what? Why two names? Yeah. Probability is like kind of the, the feature of statistics that we do with data that you already had. <clears throat> Think in terms of base networks. Okay. And try to make sense of what you want me to. What do you mean predict the future versus? Yeah. Probability is the chance that something will happen. Statistics are uh, information that you gather from things that already happen. Happen, like tests that you already run? Yeah, not quite. Okay, so here's basically what you get to see, right? Um, so in the Bhargavi, earthquake, uh, whatever, alarm, John Carl's, Mary Carl's scenario, you need a bunch of observations about how the world works. Okay, so this is the data on BEJM. You look this, at this observation and you sort of came up with some network. If I have the network, then I can, if John calls, I don't need to look at the old data. I can say, this is the way the world works. If John calls, has the uh, alarm gone off? Has John, if John calls, did the earthquake occur? You can do that. OK? So that is, um, from here, you can infer. Uh, Okay, um, so you went from here to here, you learned a model. You learned a model. You went from here to here, you did inference. And you're able to, you know, basically say the probability of event. Okay, so my question is, uh, first of all, from the base network's point of view, till now, what, which part have we done in this picture? Which part? From here to here. We didn't know, I mean, we just assumed our rich uncle or our good friend gave us this. So they have looked at the data and they have decided we know the model of the world, this is the model of the world. Right? And so we went from base networks to do inference on base networks. Ooh, wow. Uh, inference on base networks. Um, so, now the question is, this part is what is this part? 
And then there is this other part going from data to base networks. One of them is probability, one of them is statistics. Which is which? Inference is probability. Okay? What you call probability is inference. You know, when you do probability problems, somebody has already given you a model. Okay? I ask you, what is the probability of getting eight heads in a row? And you very quickly start writing the, you know, crunching the numbers. Did you ask me what kind of a uh, coin I'm using? No, you just assume there's a specific coin I'm using. That's the one everybody uses. And it has a particular model, half heads, half tails. And so you just went ahead and went directly to uh, that particular uh, scenario, right? So because you assumed you have the model, and so you only needed to do inference. OK? Uh, that's called probability. And going from data to model is statistics. So when we are talking about learning based networks, we finally are coming to statistics. And this is a loop. You know, you look at the data, you learn the model, you use the model for the next day or two to do inferences. And then as more and more data comes, you may want to relearn the model. And then for a particular day, you have new model and you use that model and you know do the inference. So that's the difference between statistics and probability. That's a useful thing to have in mind. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do now is statistics, because I told you we're going to start learning about how to do learning of base networks. That's what statisticians do, which is one of the reasons why when the area of machine learning started in AI, and in fact we will talk about machine learning for a while too, and you know you know that machine learning is a big area now. Statisticians said, ah, that's a big deal. We've been doing this forever. That's what we call statistics. And you guys want to call it machine learning? Call it. Okay, and you're just reinventing the wheel. And it turns out that for a while, maybe reinvention occurred, but in fact, the machine learning as a field right now brings everybody together, and in fact, they're able to build on each other's knowledge. So that's why the field still exists, and it's doing quite well. Okay? So saying statistical learning is saying learning, learning. Okay, statistics is learning. Statistics is going from data to a model. Then once you have the model, you predict. Okay, so when they say we're going to curve the um, class, they have marks of the individual students. They fit a particular model to these marks. They just assume that I will assume that it's a normal distribution. <coughs> so then all I need to do is find out the parameters of the normal distribution from the data. Okay, you all know that if you give a bunch of numbers and you need to fit it to the normal distribution, what would you do? The normal distribution requires mu and sigma, which is the mean and the variance. You compute mean as the average of the data, that's called mean actually, okay? And the variance as obviously the de deviation from, of each of the points from the mean. And you set those as the parameters of the normal distribution and you say, I'm done. Have you ever considered whether that has any theoretical justification for doing that? That's what we're going to do today. If you have only considered it, then I'm going to repeat it. If not, we're going to do, you know, exactly how do you learn these parameters from given the data? And once I learn the parameters, I can use the model to do the inference. So, you know, in normal scenarios, if you had class, class marks, went to a normal distribution from which grades are decided. Okay? Which grades are decided, right? Um, so the interesting thing is that this part is the inference, this part is learning. It doesn't look like I'm doing too much learning. That's because I went ahead and made up my mind, saying I must find, I shall find a normal distribution in the data. So the real question is, what's the best fit normal distribution for the data I have at hand? Okay. Any questions? Okay. So, so we're going to learn base nets, and basically that's sort of statistical learning. And what I want to do is two things. First, I want to actually try and explain to you that under Bayesian, 
stat Bayesian probability or Bayesian statistics, which we've been looking at, there is no actual difference between learning and inference. So I just said there is the learning part, there is the inference part. Okay, and then I'll convince you that it's all actually inference. And then I will convince you that, well, while that is a great idea, you know, there are reasons to sort of make learning be somewhat easier than a full inference. And that will get us to what's called maximal likelihood learning, which is what everybody does to compute the parameters. Okay, that's sort of like a quick overview of what we're going to try and do. Okay, um, so I'm going to do this now. Okay, so for a minute, actually forget about, remember, notice that it's generally trying to learn the base network parameters is sort of like trying to learn the parameters of the normal distribution. So if I know the theory for this, I know the theory for this too. Okay, um, so let's see. Here's my, you know, this is a textbook example. This is the bunch of candies, okay? And there are red candies, and there are, um, there are cherry candies, and there are lime candies the green ones and the red ones. Okay? Um, it turns out that uh, there are different kinds of bags that a manufacturer sells these in. Okay? Um, these bags are basically all plain bags. You can't write. There's nothing written outside on the bag. So they all look equally you know, white or whatever. Okay? And then one kind of a bag only has cherry candies. Another kind has 10%, uh, um, I'm sorry, so, another, so one kind of a bag, this is H1, has only cherry candies. Another kind of a bag has 74% cherry candies and 24% lime candies. Another kind has 50-50, another 25 this and 75 that, the other one 100% lime candies. I gave you a bag. You're only allowed to just pick a candy, see whether it's cherry or lime candy maybe by eating, okay, or by just looking at its color or whatever. And then from that, you need to figure out two things. I mean, what I really need to figure out is after you picked a bunch of these candies and figured out whether, you know, they are lime or uh, cherry, you need to be able to predict whether the next candy is going to be lime or cherry. What's the probability that the next candy will be lime? What's the probability that the next candy will be cherry? This problem has all the things that we have been talking about. There is data, the candies are coming, and there is prediction based on the candies you have seen till today, and till now, the next candy, what would its flavor be? Rather than go directly from data to prediction, you know that in fact, the data and predictions, are, data and future are connected through the back. So you could actually do this in, you know, in the following way. Let me hypothesize that um, I am I'm in, in all red bag. In which case, what's the probability that the next guy would be red? 100%. Let me hypothesize that I'm in 75% uh, red, 25% uh, cherry. In which case, what's the probability the next one will be red? I mean, cherry, you know, 75%. Now, obviously, what I really need to know is what is the probabilities of each of these hypotheses at any given point. If I do know it, then I can do a weighted project, weighted prediction. Okay? In the example here, I already actually gave you the prior probabilities on the hypothesis. Because I, I was told from reliable authorities that this candy manufacturer makes, you know, 10% of the bags he makes are all red, 20% are 75% red, you know, 25% green, 40% are 50-50%, 20% are uh, these, and 10% are these. You know this. I'm telling you this. This is your prior probability on these five hypotheses. Hypothesis is the model. Okay, you know that there are only five possible models because the, the only five bags are being made. I've told you this up front. Okay, so the question then is, how do I write the, you know, probabilistically, how do I write this problem of predicting the next candy? 
okay? And it turns out that you can think of the hypothesis, the model itself as a random variable. Right? The model or the hypothesis is a random variable. It can take values h1, h2, h3, h4, or h5. The prior probability of h1 is 0.1, h2 is 0.2, h3 is 0.4, h4 is 0.2, h5 is 0.1. Okay, so actually, what's interesting is once you think in terms of base networks, then everything is a base network. Okay, basically, I now have a hypothesis node, and it has a p of h, prior probability on the hypothesis. Then this hypothesis node causes d1, the first candy, d2, the second candy, d3, the third candy. D4, the fourth candy, and so on. Okay? Now, what candies can there be? D1 is a candy, right? It's either going to be uh, cherry or lime. Okay? Now, if this is a base network, what kind of properties do I need to know here? I need P, D given H. Okay, so essentially I need, what is the probability that it is cherry given H1, cherry given H2, cherry given H3, and so on. What's the probability that it's cherry given H1? One. What's the probability that it's cherry given H2? Where are you making up these numbers? It's there, it's right there. So I just gave you this base network. I just gave you a base network. You know, the, where hypothesis is a variable, data is another variable. Hypothesis is causing the data. Okay? And whenever I see the data, I can change the posterior on the hypothesis. Right? Just as in burglary earthquake, burglary has a prior probability, earthquake has a prior probability, and they both cause alarm to go off. If I tell you alarm did go off, you change your posterior probability of burglary and earthquake given alarm. Right? That's the same way, as I keep seeing the data, I keep changing my posterior probability on the hypothesis variable. Okay? And how do I change the posterior? Use the base rule. It's a base network, use the base rule. Okay, and what's interesting is I'm supposedly doing learning, which is supposed to try and tell me what the uh, you know what is the model. But I will never actually make up my mind as to what the model is. What I really care is not what the real model is, but what is the current belief as to hypothesis one, hypothesis two, hypothesis three is the real model. And if one of them has belief one and everything else becomes zero, that means you know for sure that is the model. Many a time you don't know that. Many a time all you know is this is more likely. It's become more likely. This has become more, even more likely, and so on. Okay? Um, so, by the way, so when, when then we observe candies drawn from some bag, in this case, there's a whole bunch of uh, limes, and apparently Russell doesn't like limes, so he keeps saying bad things about them. Um, so, now I'm interested in two kinds of questions. One is what kind of bag is it? That's statistics, because you're learning the model, okay? And what flavor will the next candy be? That's probability. If you know what kind of bag it is, telling what flavor it is, is child's play. But interestingly, Bayesians would not even say, I mean, you know, his view of learning would say, why do you want to know what kind of bag it is? You only really need to know what's the posterior probability on the bag distribution, given the evidence which is more general. They're just picking one hypothesis and going with it. Do people see this? Okay, so, so this is my picture that, that I do here. Hypothesis is causing data, D1 all the way to Dn, okay? And I have the prior of the hypothesis. I have the data given hypothesis, which is the PD given H. And what I really need, P H given D. 
what is posterior probability of hypothesis given data okay that would be essentially f for times p d given h i by times p h i and this is just very slow right a given b is b given a times a probability of b given a I mean, probability of a given b is probability of b given a times probability of a divided by probability of b you get rid of probability of b by putting the normalization so the thing that may or may not be able to appreciate it is i hope you will is we said we'll do learning and yet we're just doing inference all we're doing is we're doing inference with one extra variable called the hypothesis variable and that now becomes learning suddenly so bayesians have a great life because they only need to know how to do inference okay um, so h i given d is alpha times you know p d h i times p h l okay and so this will be giving you your posterior probability distribution on the hypothesis and if you happen to know p h i given d then you can compute p x given d that is the next data given all the data till now can be written as the next data given all the data and the hypothesis h i being the current hypothesis times <coughs> h i given d and since the hypothesis is causing the data given the hypothesis this guy is not influenced by these guys again base rules base network rules so all i'm trying to find out is dn plus 1 given d1 to dn and the hypothesis but if i give you hypothesis then dn plus 1 only depends on the hypothesis it doesn't depend on this because given the immediate parent you are independent of your non descendants right okay so that basically then then that that basically and then now you have to wait it summit over all the hypothesis okay so if this was the hypothesis 1 what is the probability that the next one would be cherry times the probability that it is hypothesis 1 given all the data i have seen plus if it is hypothesis 2 what is the probability that the next candy will be cherry times the probability that it is actually hypothesis 2 given all the data i have seen and this part is being computed here that's the posterior on the that's the posterior on the uh, hypothesis okay and um, so you got this this is just elementary probability elementary base rule okay but plus of course our understanding of base nets so now if i were to apply this to my example okay this is how things look it's a beautiful picture um here i was able to represent probability distributions on the hypothesis p of h is where in this here the intercepts on y axis are p of h prior on the hypothesis in the beginning okay so and then so basically it says red is red is h1 green is h2 blue is h3 obviously this is not well color coded right basically it should have, this should have been red and this should have been green because this is all red this is all green but you know it's, it has its own color coding So red is H1, H2 is this, H3 is this, H4 is this, H5 is this, and notice that if you haven't seen any data, probability of hypothesis given no data is the prior probability of the hypothesis. So in the beginning, you essentially had uh, two which are at point one, two which are at point two, one which is at point four. That's what we had, right? and if you were to just follow bayes inference and consider what have compute the posterior distribution after seeing one cherry after see two cherries i'm sorry why is like okay one one line two lines three lines four lines and so on and then at any particular point of time after seeing one line that's your <coughs> posterior distribution notice that the red guy went to zero not surprising right because if you really believe if you originally thought that the bag would be all cherries and the first one you picked is a lime then your probability the probability you would assign to your belief that it's a bag of all cherries has just gone down to zero 
You see what I'm saying? You learn something. But it's not really learning, it's just inference. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay. Um, so by this time itself, you already figured out that it's only one of these hypotheses. After seeing one cherry candy, suddenly now you only have four hypotheses left with non-zero probability. After seeing two cherry candies, after seeing one lime candy, it is this. After seeing two lime candies, it is this. After seeing three lime candies, it is this. And do you notice that the all lime guy keeps increasing in probability? And around the, you know, 10, you are essentially thinking you know, that the probability you assign to H2 is already close to 0, to assign to H3 is already close to 0, um, H5 is quite close to 1, and the only thing that still has some non-zero probability left is this guy. In essence, you are coming to the inescapable conclusion that you are stuck with a bag of limes. And you did this just from the data. Now, did you learn? Yeah, of course you learned. You have a new posterior distribution on the hypothesis. Right? And at any point, if I were to ask you, after seeing one cherry, if you were to predict what is going to be the next color of the next one, and I compute the error in your prediction, OK? I can draw that. That is the prediction accuracy, OK? And the prediction accuracy is shown. The prediction accuracy is shown here. So the pictures here are that to get this prediction accuracy, px given d is summation over the hypothesis, where the hypothesis, the data given the uh, data given the hypothesis times hypothesis given the data. Hypothesis given the data is the posterior probability that we just computed up until that point. So what's my belief based on all the evidence I have seen till now? Based on my belief, what's my belief that what's going to be the next data that will show up? That's the prediction, right? And that, as you see, the error, the, are basically the probability that the next candy is lime, you know, uh, is going from 0.5 all the way to 1 by the time you see 10 lime candies. And it turns out that's pretty much what you expect, right? I mean, in fact, you are getting pretty good accuracy you know, in realizing that the next one that's going to come is line. OK? I might say, why do I need this elaborate equipment? If I see 10 lines, I assume the next one is also a line. OK? But don't be so sure. OK? Here is a um, coin I'm about to toss. OK? I tossed heads, tossed heads, tossed heads. Next one, what is it going to be? Why don't you say heads? Why didn't you say heads? Sorry. Because, <laughs> because you have a model. You had a prior on the hypothesis. OK, now here's the same coin. I tossed it a million times, heads. What's the next one? Heads. Heads. You better say heads, otherwise you'll lose in Las Vegas. <laughs> right? right? If they have a coin and they've been passing a million times in front of you and it still comes heads, saying, oh, they must be fair. It's just a statistical fluke that they got a million heads in a row. Let me still think it can come, you know. There, there are some, I mean, in fact, Las Vegas is made up of these kinds of fools who think that the more heads have come till now, there's more chance that a tail is just dying to come out next. So we should put all our money as well as our friend's money and tail. Right? Right? And they're missing in two different ways. Point one is, in fact, if the model hasn't changed, and if, if it is a fair coin, the tosses are independent, first of all. And if the model is adaptive and, it, and you didn't know what the coin's actual parameters are, you should be able to update based on what is happening. You should do both, to be rational as well as keep some money when you get out of Las Vegas. The best is not to go, but if you go, then you know, if you want to come out, you, know, you should be rational in this sense. Right? And the way you do it is Bayesian learning. Essentially, you have priors on the hypothesis originally, and then you update those priors based on your data. 
basically the reason you were not ready to say after three heads that the next one will also be heads is because your prior is very strong that origin that you know the parameter uh, the probability that uh, the point comes heads is the parameter okay and essentially i'm asking i'm asking i have a para i have a coin what do you think is the probability that this coin will come heads if you think everybody can have any random kind of a coin then you should think it's basically uniform probability that means heads can come with point one probability point two probability point three probability etc if on the other hand you believe that most of the world doesn't have that many different kinds of coins and they're all fair mostly but there may be some crooks then your probability distribution might look like that and at point 5 you think there's a very high probability that the coin is fair that's what you thought and my showing you three heads was not enough to change your mind that it's not a fair coin but my showing you a million heads was enough to change your mind that it's no longer a fair coin yeah i understand it's really really i thought it's a fair coin i gave you like 15 20 30 million chances now you you told me that i should change my change my mind right okay um, so that's basically innocent and up you know proven guilty prior okay we'll assume everybody is using a fair coin but we do assume we do realize that there are some crooks and so there's some probability that it's not 0.5 one interesting question is what if you put all the probability mass only here 1.0 here and 0 everywhere else then you are dead then even if you see a million heads in a row 2 billion heads in a row 28000 billion heads in a row you will still think it's just a statistical problem no fluke you need to entertain the possibility that you could be wrong about your your assumption that people are fair you need to entertain that probability if you don't entertain it at all then you would be a fool if you think everybody is out to get you you'd going to be a paranoid between fooldom and paranoia decide us okay okay so the thing is that you start with a prior in your head and then you're seeing the evidence to change the prior into posterior there are actually cognitive studies on people that give evidence that that lend credence to this uh, theory that in fact we are born with priors and that we are not born necessarily at least we seem to have good priors associated with different kinds of things just as you would have a prior associated with you know coin you just tend to assume that it's more likely to be a fair coin and then not okay and base learning base in learning does takes care of that so i could actually stop 15 minutes ahead of schedule and say we have done learning and we have just said learning is the same as based in inference and you would be happy and we would be done early okay now what's the problem why don't i want to stop <laughs> here you have a prior saying he never wants to stop <laughs> so i'm prior you should entertain the possibility that sometimes i will stop when i'm done okay um so what's the probability what's the problem what's the reason um the reason is bayesian inference is indeed the best way to do learning but it's too hard because you in essence have to track the whole entire space of hypothesis people want to jump to conclusions people want to jump to conclusions right okay and they want to stick to one hypothesis because it's easier it's memory efficient keep keeping track of all five hypotheses and their posterior probabilities is more work it's optimal but it's more work okay furthermore you know here there was five hypotheses in this case how many hypotheses were there actually in the case of probability of the fairness of the coin the infinite number of hypotheses the probability that it will come heads 
with 0 0.001 probability, 0 0.00111 probability, 0 0.00001123 probability, and so on. Every probability number is a hypothesis. There are infinite number of hypotheses. And you have to track them. I understand it's not that bad. Basically, you have to, in those cases, you need to have another you know, analytical probability distribution. Okay, something like a normal distribution or a Poisson distribution or something. But you know, it can get pretty nasty in terms of having to look at all the hypotheses. So there are two kinds of approximations that are done typically to the Bayesian learning idea. So Bayesian learning is no different from Bayesian inference. But the two approximations that I'll tell you will make Bayesian learning be different from Bayesian inference. And those approximations are done to make your life simple. That's all. They are not the optimal things to do. Do you understand what I'm saying? OK. So any, in terms of, sometimes people will say, OK, is this learning algorithm good? The best way to argue that is, is it Bayesian optimal? How close is it to the Bayesian optimal learning algorithm? And the Bayesian optimal learning algorithm is the one we just discussed till now, just as inference over the hypothesis posterior. The reason I don't want to do it is because there is too many hypotheses. So I want to pick a hypothesis. Notice that while I am predicting, while I'm predicting, right, um, sorry, while I'm predicting, um, while I'm predicting, I'm basically summing over all the hypotheses. I don't want to do that. I want to just pick one hypothesis. And then assume, in a sense, that everything else is you know, the probability of the rest of the hypothesis are zero. In which case, the sum goes away. So prediction becomes easy. So the question, of course, is which HI are you going to pick? OK? In, the, in this, this basically, um, in this case, you know, let's say I would like to say probably that if I have to pick one, maybe I'll pick this. If I have to pick one here, maybe I'll pick this. By the time if I have to pick one, maybe I'll pick this. That's a reasonable thing to do. So pick the one that has the highest posterior probability. That's a reasonable thing. Agreed? OK? And so that's basically is the first idea we will try. The first idea we will try is we will pick that HI which will make this particular term the maximum. OK? Uh, now, if it, this particular term is maximum, then the log of this particular term will also be maximum. That's where those logs come in. We like logs because in probabilities, if you are lucky, everything would be independent, in which case you multiply. Multiplication is not good for differentiation. Because remember, then fg dash is f dash g plus g dash f. You know, you'll get sick and tired of it. Whereas if you have fg, you take log of fg, it'll become log of f plus log of g. Then you can do log, you know, simple differentiation on the logs. So everybody essentially takes logs on products in probabilities. And they call them log likelihoods. Really, the reason it is good is because log is a monotonically increasing function. So if a function has a maximum, log of that function has the maximum exactly at that point. It has value different, but the x value at which log of the function becomes maximum is the same as the function becoming maximum. So if I optimize the log of a function, if I take the max of the log of a function, then I also took the log of the original function, I'm sorry, the, the maximum of the original function. OK. So I can uh, I maximize the, I pick the HI that maximizes PDHI given PHI, which in essence is picking the HI that maximizes this sum, log of PD given HI plus log of P given HI. Notice the interesting question, which is, this part you see, this is basically the likelihood of the data given the hypothesis. Likelihood of the data given the hypothesis. This, on the other hand, is the likelihood of the hypothesis itself. To some extent, that's sort of a penalty on crazy hypothesis. Do you see what I'm saying? Sometimes the evidence might be consistent with both a simple explanation and a very convoluted, complicated explanation. And then what does science supposed to do? Well, I mean, for example, how did we figure out that it's not sun that is rotating around Earth? 
but earth that is rotating around sun the first obvious hypothesis we have to come up with is obviously we are the center of the universe everything is rotating around us and then people kept coming up with more and more evidence that was killing that model so people will make the model even more complex they'll say oh on saturdays at you know 3 o'clock it will be slightly different from this so i've actually gone to museums in in, in europe you know where there are highly highly complex models of how planets revolve and they were made that complex just so that you will agree with the data you see what i'm saying and then copernicus said hey you know did you consider just considering the other possibility that maybe we are revolving we are the bozo sun is the big guy and that too explains the data so does your huge big complicated looking uh, you know 15000 uh, element model why won't you consider this and then pop says we'll put you in jail <laughs> well copernicus is actually a smart guy he kept his mouth shut Galileo, on the other hand, went around saying, oh, "What the heck? You know, this is what we should do." Okay, and then of course he was put in jail. Okay, but the point is, what happened there? This is this is how we learn in life. We have a complex hypothesis as well as a simple hypothesis, which both explains the data to the same level of accuracy. Which one would you pick? You typically want to pick simple. That simple versus complex is in terms of this log of p h i. so you're thinking it's very very unlikely that the universe would be so darn complex that it require a room sized model to explain how earth goes i mean how sun goes around earth maybe there's a much smaller model about that explains how earth goes around sun which agrees with everything just as well and in fact better and so you give up on this model and go to this model do you see what i'm saying and in science this is what we do in science basically people can't say i don't want to really decide. so imagine doing bayesian learning in science then basically the kids will say well okay copernicus says this pope says this i will keep both of them around so the uh, you know, world will be either going you know with you know earth around sun or sun around earth and there are probabilities for both of them and i will always make weighted predictions then there won't be any science textbooks because there is no model to write you never commit so what science does is it picks a hypothesis so it picks a model and the model it picks is based on how well that model agrees with the data which is what always science says right that you know experimental truth is what matters if the hypothesis you know are the side um, what is aldous huxley said are the side of the sad spectacle of science a beautiful hypothesis slain by an ugly fact okay the beautiful hypothesis you have all worked out and one ugly fact showed up one ugly experiment showed up and you have to kill this hypothesis but that's about this part but we also have where is the part about phi it's beautiful hypothesis we have priors on what hypothesis are beautiful what are not beautiful what are more likely up front and what are less likely up front and if you take both of them that is called maximum a posteriori approximation to learning maximum a posteriori approximation to learning the beauty of this is you not only care about how well your hypothesis explains the data but you also care about how likely is the hypothesis which is what bayesians do right basically when you go to the doctor you know you have runny nose you could be getting runny nose because of flu that explains runny nose you could be getting runny nose because of ebola that also explains runny nose they are not allowed to specify ebola medication to you because ebola prior probability is extremely low compared to flu flu and ebola are the hypothesis in our case okay so we started with bayesian learning we made an approximation to come here now what do you think machine learning as a field is currently based on not even this even this is too much <laughs> right what do you want to say is well in fact if i have so much data if i have so much data then ultimately this term will dominate this term so it doesn't really matter what this term was and we are living in the world of plenty of data 
right? I mean, at least plenty of you know, certain types of data, there's plenty of them. Right? I mean, you have, you're trying to, for example, get a model for what is a spam mail, what is not a spam mail. There are gazillion, billion species of spam mail that's coming out every day. So you don't really need, you don't really need any priors. The data will eventually tell you where to go. So in that sense, I can say if there is enough data, I can ignore priors. In which case, I will just be picking the hypothesis that increases the log likelihood. Log likelihood. That's it. Okay? I wouldn't even care about the prior of the hypothesis. I just, of the many hypotheses, I'll pick that one which increases which maximizes the log likelihood, okay? And uh, just, we'll come back to this later, but, uh, in next class, but it turns out that, you know, a particular, let's say, a base network like this, I give you uh, the topology, and you don't know the CPTs. You want to learn the CPTs from the data. So imagine this type, this topology, this is theta, this is unknown random variable. This is theta one, this is theta two. Then I will show you next class, you can also look ahead before, um, that the log likelihood of the data, given a particular hypothesis, each hypothesis here is theta, theta one, theta two, is a different hypothesis. Every possible combination of theta, theta one, theta two is a different hypothesis. There are infinite possible combinations of them, because there are infinite combinations of infinite values of theta, infinite values of theta one, infinite value of theta two, multiply them, you get, you know, infinite cube, which is still infinite. Right? So I compute the probability of the data given my hypothesis, which will be a function of the parameters of the hypothesis. I want to maximize this. So I take the log, I will get a logarithmic expression. This looks suspiciously like one of the expressions I gave you earlier. Right? I need to maximize this. How do you maximize functions? You know, spring break is a good time to go back to your calculus textbooks. Uh, you maximize functions by taking, if nothing else, you take the derivative and set it equal to zero. You know a lot more than that, but at least that is a starting point. And if you have a multi-valued, multi-variable expression, here you have three variable expression, you take, you take partial derivatives with respect to theta, theta one, and theta two, equate them all to zeros, from which you will be able to compute theta, theta one, theta two values, which are the optimal estimates. And after doing all that, you would find that that's what I would have done if you didn't tell me anything. But now you know why you're doing it right. Do you see what I'm saying? So that's basically, so we went from why learning is not special at all to why we should keep learning a little special. We should keep learning a little special because otherwise we have to keep around too many hypotheses. But then, you know, jumping ahead to a specific hypothesis does give you troubles. You know, as I said, you know, if you don't have priors, then essentially you don't know which hypothesis is more likely, which is less likely. And so you can get into trouble, especially as I said, if you give zeros to some of the possibilities, then you will never learn uh, the possibility that, in fact, you have an unfair call. Okay? So I will stop there, and I want to tell you that I actually did a big favor to you, uh, which you don't know at all. I was this close to having the one missing class that I'm supposed to teach tomorrow. And I actually had this room all booked, but then as a big you know, spring break present, we don't have that class. <laughs> okay? This is like you know, Department of Homeland Security who say, you don't know what we are doing. You know, anything not happening is because of us. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> have a great spring break. We'll